When it comes to large and in-charge wagons, how can you beat the 1971-76 Oldsmobile Custom Cruiser? The top of the line Oldsmobile wagon during these years, the Custom Cruiser was introduced in 1971 alongside all new full-size vehicles from General Motors. Before this, Oldsmobile didn't have a Custom Cruiser. It did have the stately Vista Cruiser with its Vista roof. But you couldn't get anything that was more luxurious or larger than that Vista Cruiser. However, by the time 1971 rolled around, Oldsmobile decided that it needed a absolutely huge wagon to ride atop a 127-inch wheelbase to complement the Vista Cruiser as well as the lower-end Cutlass Cruiser, basically a Vista Cruiser with a shorter wheelbase that didn't have the overhead see-through glass. Thus, the Custom Cruiser was born, and it would go on to be Oldsmobile's top-of-the-line wagon until it was sunset in the 1992 model year. And by the way, that 1992 model year wagon was really just a two-year wagon. It was only produced in 1991 and 1992 in that particular body style before the Custom Cruiser would be sent out to pasture. Today we're going to talk about not the first year of the new full-size Custom Cruiser, which was 1971. We're going to talk about 1972 because, well, I want to. I tend to like the 1972 styling on the Oldsmobiles better. Anyway, so let's examine some shots of the Oldsmobile Custom Cruiser for 1972 and talk about the strange features, quirks, and idiosyncrasies associated with it because they are myriad. And let's start with the front end of the Custom Cruiser here, because there's a lot to talk about. The first thing that you'll notice on the front end of this Custom Cruiser is the egg crate pattern grill. This grill was borrowed from the Oldsmobile 98. The Delta 88 had kind of a thin blade design, but the 98 had this egg crate pattern because for whatever reason, egg crate grills, for many years actually before 1972, tended to symbolize luxury, and they were often found on upper-end makes, and many Cadillacs, especially those of even 1972, featured this egg crate grill pattern. So that was a nod to more luxurious styling cues. You'll also notice here that the bumper is getting a little bit bigger, and this one has some nice bumper guards as well that are flanking the center of that header panel. And that's because this was the first year that the federal government would introduce a two and a half mile per hour impact standard associated with front bumpers, which meant that you had to be able to crash the vehicle into a stationary flat barrier at two and a half miles per hour, and it could not sustain any damage. So as a consequence, this bumper is getting a little bit bigger here on this Oldsmobile. You notice it has a rub strip as well. And actually behind the bumper is a piece of spring steel so that if the car came into contact with something, it would actually kind of collapse upon itself briefly before springing back into the shape that you see here. That bumper impact standard would be increased to 5 miles an hour in the front in 1973 and then 5 miles an hour in the front in 1974, as well as 5 miles per hour in the rear. So bumpers just get progressively chunkier as the years would go on. Another thing to note about the front of these vehicles is that that header panel, that portion in front of the hood and the fenders, is actually not metal. It's fiberglass or sheet molded compound on these. So while you may think that your 1970s Oldsmobile is all pure metal, actually the front portion of the vehicle is not. And there's also a little piece out back that isn't either. Well, two little pieces. We're going to talk about those in a second. Let's finish off the discussion of the front with the rocket logo that is shown there in the middle of the vehicle. And I love the rocket logo from Oldsmobile. I think it's just so classy and mid-century modern. But one of the things that many people don't know is that this rocket logo was actually patterned off of a Luxury Makes logo during the time. Can you guess which one? Not Cadillac, not patterned off of the wreath and crest, but it is patterned off of the Lincoln logo. Yes, that is absolutely true. And Oldsmobile thought they would take a cue from an upper end mark, and they did so with Lincoln, and it worked out quite well. One last thing here I will just say, you notice that there's no antenna in the front of the vehicle. That's because it's incorporated into the windshield on these vehicles, which was true for all GM full sizers. That technology was actually introduced by GM in the 1969 Grand Prix. And some people loved it, some people hated it, but GM kind of proliferated it across their car lineup for the most part in the 1970s and even into the trucks. But it all started with the 1969 Grand Prix. 
Now, as we turn to the side of this Custom Cruiser, you note that it has this faux wood paneling on the side, kind of a nod to earlier woody wagons. And yes, unfortunately, it isn't real. It is fake, but they did that because it was more durable than real wood and also cheaper. So two for one benefit there. You'll also notice that it kind of has an odd termination there at the front of the vehicle. And you can see that header panel that I was discussing a bit better that was made out of fiberglass. That portion is not covered by the faux wood grain. This wagon is a basically pillared sedan, or it's based on the pillared sedan. GM hadn't made hardtop wagons since the 1950s, although Chrysler had produced them into the 1960s. But by this point, all the wagons had pillars associated with them. This one also does not have the outside rear view mirror that could be controlled with the little joystick control inside. This is a manual outside rear view mirror here that you'd have to roll the window down or push the power window button and then adjust it by hand. Notice also, if you look toward the rear of the car, it has this kind of fin language associated with it that came from the Olds 98. So the egg crate grill came from the Olds 98, as did these mini fins. And the Olds 98, we're going to talk about when we get to the rear a little bit more, had some vertical styling cues that emulated, well, Cadillac. You'll also notice that the exhaust pipe is coming out the side of the vehicle as opposed to pointing rearward. As is typical for most cars, that's done on wagons so that the exhaust doesn't backdraft in through the vehicle when you have the rear window down, in case you're wondering. So you often see the exhaust pointed out to the side on wagons or any of the vehicles where the rear window can lower, like blazers of the era as well. Now, as we rotate around to the rear of the vehicle, this is a different custom cruiser. Notice this one doesn't have the wood grain, I think because it's been repainted here and probably they couldn't find a replacement wood grain. But in any case, the wagon still looks good. Notice the roof panel there kind of lifts up aft of the rear door. And that's because Oswiel and I'll say the GM engineers in general were trying to get a little bit more headroom for the third row seat in these clamshell wagons, as opposed to other wagons of the time that had rear facing seats where the rear facing seats were often aft of the rear axle. Here, the third row seat actually faces forward, and it's pretty much right over that rear axle. So you need some more headroom, and that's why there's that bump in the roof to give that third seat set of passengers a little bit more room in the rear. You're also starting to notice that this Oldsmobile was one of the so-called clamshell wagons. Take a look at that rear tailgate and rear window glass area. It's pretty large, and as opposed to other makes during the time, like Ford that had the dual action tailgate that either swung out or dropped down like a tailgate, here you had the clamshell that the glass would be power operated and move up into the roof when you wanted to open the rear. And then you could drop the tailgate down. There were two different types of tailgates. There was a manual operating tailgate and there was a power operated tailgate. So that would go underneath the bumper. And you had this kind of great wide open area that you could then load cargo into. I'll show another picture of the dead on rear view of this vehicle, but let's just take a look again at the styling theme. You notice, as I said, these little fins that are starting kind of at the rear door and then making their way rearward. And the Custom Cruiser, as well as the Olds 98 during these years, had vertical styling cues. And that had really started for Oldsmobile on the 98s back in 1963 when the Olds 98 first got some vertical styling cues. And again, that was to give it kind of a cadillac -y feel. And those vertical tail lamps would become a styling cue for Olds 98s all the way through till the end. It kind of stayed with the vehicle. I think it's rather handsome. And I will point out something else that's special about that fin and that's unique to the Custom Cruiser. This wasn't true of the Olds 98. Take a look at the top of the fin there at the rear, and you'll notice there's a little piece that's actually forming the fin separate from the rear quarter panel. That was unique to the Custom Cruiser. I guess they just couldn't stamp the sheet metal appropriately to make that fin work, so they had to put a part on there to make the fin. It's kind of an interesting little tidbit on these vehicles. Now, if we rotate around to a complete rear view, you can see those vertical fins as well as the vertical taillights. Again, characteristic of the Olds 98. And you can also see the clamshell wagon in all of its glory with that 
retractable upper glass, as well as the tailgate that drops down. This is a power-operated model. You can tell that because there's no little grab handle in the center of the tailgate, and also around the lock cylinder there on the passenger side, there is not a release like set of tabs that are encircling that lock cylinder as you would have on a manual tailgate. Let's take a look and see what the clamshell looks like with the tailgate down and the window up. And here's a picture with the tailgate down and the retractable window up. You also notice the rear seat, the third rear seat that I was mentioning before is facing forward. And the other interesting thing here is that this opening is rather narrow. This cargo area isn't as large as on other wagons of the era. And that's just due to this particular design choice that Oldsmobile elected to make, as well as the other GM divisions in producing this wagon. But the clamshell style here, I have to say, is pretty cool. I love the wraparound rear glass there, too. That's pretty sweet. You do not see that on many wagons at all. Now, unfortunately, these custom cruisers are so rare that I really couldn't find a good picture of an interior of one. But the interiors on the custom cruiser, aside from some minor seat trim and the door panels, are basically similar to the Oldsmobiles that were produced. And the IP was shared across the 8898 custom cruiser. The Tornado had a little bit different IP in it. But you see that this Oldsmobile cluster has the wraparound shape, the driver-centric shape that was very popular in the GM full-size vehicles. Actually, all of them had that type of an instrument cluster for the 1971 to 73 model years, except the Chevrolet. So they all had kind of this driver-centric wrap-around style cockpit, if you will. And notice this one isn't an overly high option one. It has the two-spoke steering wheel, doesn't have the tilt telescoping wheel, has manual air conditioning. You can see that over there on the driver's side, left of the speedometer. And this one doesn't have either cruise control, rear defogger, or the night watch system because those would be little toggle switches in that pod on the left-hand side. And we'll see what those look like. I have a picture of an Olds 98 with them. And you could get all those features in the custom cruiser. Most of you would know what cruise control is as well as the rear defroster. But the night watch setup was a setup that allowed you to keep the headlamps on for a period of time before they would turn off. And they would also automatically turn on. So kind of like a Twilight Sentinel for Cadillac, but in Oldsmobiles. Also notice here on the passenger side, kind of above the glove box, this little piece of fake wood grain. You can't quite see it, but it has the Oldsmobile logo on it. That's where the clock would go if you got the optional electric clock. This car doesn't have the optional electric clock. So it just has that faux wood grain plug. And just so you can see what I'm talking about with the toggle switches, this is a photo from a 72 Olds 98 Regency with the super puffy button tufted seats as well as the Tiffany clock over there on the passenger side. You can notice those three toggle switches that are in the driver's pod and the instrument cluster. So this car has all three of those options, the cruise control, the rear defrogger, I should say the rear defroster, as well as the night watch setup. And you can see the speedometer kind of laid out in a square shape that goes to 120 miles per hour here. And you get a look at the supersize Olds brake and accelerator pedal. Oldsmobile had some pretty sweet accelerator pedals during this time frame. Got to feel powerful when you were driving your Oldsmobile. This car also has the tilt wheel. You can tell that because you see the turn signal stock and then another lever coming out of the steering column. But it does not have the telescoping wheel. If you got the telescoping wheel, you got a three-spoke design that you can see here. And this particular Oldsmobile doesn't have all three of those options. This has just one. I think it's the cruise control because I can see the end of the turn signal stock has a button there. But you also get to see the Olds 98 Regency seats and door panels in a bit uh, more detail here. I wish they had put this interior in the custom cruiser. I don't know why they wouldn't. It perhaps wouldn't have been as durable as the materials that were used in the wagons, but would have been super cool. Now, for reference, here's a picture from the 1972 Oldsmobile brochure. And the rightmost picture, the interior there, is from the Custom Cruiser. Kind of a, well, somewhat bland vinyl overall, so not all that glamorous. But you can also see a picture there of the glide-away tailgate, as Oldsmobile called it, in contrast to what the Vista Cruiser had, which is the 
midsection of the photos, which had the dual action tailgate. And on the left, you have the Cutlass Cruiser, which was a lower end wagon, the absolute bottom end wagon that had a smaller wheelbase than the Vista Cruiser and didn't have that little top where you could see through the glass and look out. But the Custom Cruiser had 127 inch wheelbase. You can see here 227 inches in overall length, 5109 curb weight. This is a big, big wagon. And notice the optional equipment that's listed there. Of course, you've got the typical power goodies, including the power glide away tailgate. I guess what's surprising to me is that you could get a vinyl rooftop on your Custom Cruiser. I don't think I've ever seen a Custom Cruiser with a vinyl roof. That would be an interesting look. Also notice that the standard and only engine is a Rocket 455 V8 with a four-barrel carburetor. This would have made 225 net horsepower. Let's talk a little bit more about that engine now. And here you have the Olds Rocket 455. This particular vehicle is loaded up with cruise control. You can see that diaphragm there on the front of the engine as well as the cruise control box that's on the driver's side fender. Interestingly, the wheelhouses in these Oldsmobiles are actually plastic. Oldsmobile pioneered that for General Motors, and it was a great idea. They couldn't rust out. They were durable, and they were made out of a really heavy-duty plastic. I've never seen these wheelhouses crack. They were a great design, and frankly, other General Motors divisions started using them. You'll also notice that this is an Oldsmobile V8. You can tell by a number of well, elements here. One is the paint color on the engine, which still at this point was different. This is the Oldsmobile blue paint. And you have the oil fill that's up front on the engine. That was only on Oldsmobiles by this point, although other GM engines, including some Chevrolet small blocks, had their oil fill tube in that location in previous years. Now, 1972 wasn't a bad year for the 455, but it was starting to, I guess, lose some horsepower because of emission standards. And unfortunately, as the years would go on, by 1975, 1976, the Olds 455 was making just 190 net horsepower. So down from 225, it actually put out 250 horsepower if you got dual exhaust. But again, with the emission standards, this Olds 455 unfortunately just got increasingly tamed all the way through the 1976 model year. And that would be the last year for the Oldsmobile 455. It was introduced in 1968, and it would run through 1976. And after that, the Olds 403 small block was the largest Oldsmobile V8 that you could get. You also notice the huge GMA6 or Frigidaire air conditioning compressor on the passenger side there. These cars had icy cold air conditioning, charged up with about four and a half pounds, of R12 refrigerant. You could cool that big cabin in these Oldsmobiles. And in fact, Ford Motor Company actually started using the GMA6 compressors because they couldn't get their York two-piston style compressor systems to cool these big wagons and the Lincolns. And in 1972, in the Lincoln Mark IV, as well as the Continental, they would actually switch to the GM system, but humorously put a Ford label over top of the air conditioning compressor to convince people that it was a Ford part. Well, it wasn't. It was really a GM part. Also, this Oldsmobile V8 has a really ingenious cost savings element, and that is that the intake and exhaust valves on the front bank of cylinders and the rearmost bank of cylinders on either side are inverted when compared with the center bank of cylinders. So that means that the exhaust manifolds on these Oldsmobile V8s can be shorter than they were on other V8s of the period. I don't think anybody else really did this, but it occurred on all the Oldsmobile V8s. And there you have it, the 1972 Oldsmobile Custom Cruiser. I love these wagons. Someday I hope to find one. I have thus far been unsuccessful in finding any 1972 Oldsmobile, at least full-size Oldsmobile, in good condition. I'd love an 88, 98 Custom Cruiser, but unfortunately, as the years have gone on, they have become increasingly hard to find in excellent condition, and whatever the 72 Oldsmobile that I would have must have the 455. So if you find one, or you have one, and you're looking to sell it, let me know. Thanks again for watching, and until next time, take care.